Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Hello, I am so excited to welcome you to our very first Experimental Leader live podcast. I am so excited to be with you today. Um, And I've been thinking about my own leadership. um, And this summer, I took a lot of time. Uh, I took some time off of having interviews on my podcast. I really tried to take some time um, working as a coach over the last year and a half had an emotional toll. And so I really wanted to do some deep self-care. And I also wanted to reflect on my business and my own leadership and to really figure out what was important to me to carry into this fall. Um, Often because I have kids, um, the fall is a time that we really start up again. And I really wanted to think about my podcast We've been doing it now since April of 2020, and uh, we've been super successful. We've been really happy with the conversations we're having, with the learning that we're having, with the, um, the availability for a platform to share ideas and talk about ideas. And I realized that I have been a guest on several platforms, um, several podcasts that used a different platform, a live platform. And I really fell in love with it. Um, This platform has the ability to take questions um, in real time. Um, We're able to do some new things. And so I want, I wanted to make a change. And so this is my new strategy for the podcast. I want to go live. We're going to be going live on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube every week at 1230 Eastern time. And I'm so excited to be with you here today. My leadership is to continue to try to make our experience with our clients and the people who we touch on social media, on our podcast, more uh, relevant, more fresh, more current. And so this live podcast is how we'll be doing this. We'll continue to stream all of our podcasts on Um, all the podcast platforms, and they'll go up about a month later. So you'll really get the freshest content by watching us live. Um, It's super exciting to be here. um, And it's super exciting to be in this leadership conversation with you, to talk about what leaders do on the ground, to ask them questions. I, I really will ask them anything. There's also an opportunity on my website to go in and send in a a video, I mean, an audio recording for us to ask a question on your behalf of a guest. So uh, we're excited about this and uh, we are super excited to be here with you. Um, Today, my guest, I'm so excited about my guest today. I want to tell you about Sophie McLean. So Sophie was born in Algeria. She was educated in Morocco and France, and she's had a professional career in the U.S. and the U.K. She's had an eventful life. At the age of 12, she experienced a profound transformation that radically altered the course of her life, and it marked the beginning of her spiritual journey. Today, we're going to find out more about her as a leader And I am so excited to have Sophie McLean here live today. Welcome, Sophie. Melanie, thank you for having me. I'm the first one on this new live podcast, right? So let me wish you the most amazing success and fulfillment for your enterprise. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's It's really fun to have you here. 
I'd love to, I'd love to just dive right in mm -hmm. and ask you what you're up to in your work and your life right now. Well, I uh, came back to New York in November, no, in September 2019, um, after spending <laughs> 10 years on a spiritual quest. And uh, I came back just on time for COVID, the confinement. So I started mm -hmm. my uh, uh, enterprise of uh, awareness, my company is called Access to Awareness. Then I had to go online and redesign uh, my program so that it worked online and that's what I do. I uh, teach people the access to remember who they really are. Oh, I, I can't wait to learn more. So, so tell me about your programs. What kind of programs do you have to teach people more about who they really are? So I have been at it for 30 years, right? So they are, um, there is all sorts of programs. I, there is a free course. There is a 21-day course. There is a three-month course. There is really one-on-one -on -one courses. So I've made myself available for any finance uh, level and every uh, desire of my uh, students. And all the courses are based on three, mostly three principles. The first one is suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. And that is much more profound than it sounds. It is really possible to live a life free of suffering. The second one is um, most human beings feel trapped, but the feeling are very real, but the trap is not. Mm. So if you try to get out of a trap that is an illusion, you're going to be very goofy. Right, So that is the illusion of life that you need to realize. And the third principle is that anything you identify with is not who you are. So you to be able to access authentic power, intuition, guidance, you need to remember who you really are. Mm. So my programs are all designed around those. And... Um I imagine there's people listening who think, well, I know who I am. Mm. How yeah. would someone know that they could use your program, that it would be right for them? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, just by bringing awareness to who you think you are. Uh, but if you, you know, awareness is the ultimate power, right? Awareness, I, I make it very simple, but awareness is when you teach your children to cross the street, right? You tell them, stop look right, look left, and then cross the street. Okay, that's awareness. It doesn't take Einstein, right, to practice awareness. So when you stop for a second and examine what you identify with, and you play a game of, am I that? No, am I that? No. So you can start, am I my job title? No. Am I the amount of money I have? No. Am I my body? No. Am I a, even a woman? No, you are what we call a woman, but you are not a woman, right? Am I a mother? No, you are what we call a mother. It's a description of a mother, but who you are is not really a mother, right? And you go on. It's a very Zen exercise. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You will finally arrive at a point where first you might get exager exasperated saying, all right, fine, I don't know who I am. And then you will actually be able to get an experience of your essence. And that moment is truly, truly magical, truly magical. You just realize that you are not a thing. You, you, you know, people call it soul or higher self, but when you get an experience of who you really are, all the problems, confusion, frustration disappears. That's mm -hmm. delicious. Mm. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so fascinated because obviously, um, obviously there are all sorts of modalities who use some of the same language you use. So Buddhism talks about suffering, yeah. um, which I love this 
I love that language so much. Um, I, I talk about it also like, oh, I'm, I see you, once you see suffering as opposed to something that's happening, it's really interesting to, to name that it's suffering. Um, and I also, uh, there's a guy named Eliyahu Goldrat, who was an Israeli physicist who worked in manufacturing. And he always talked about management attention being the biggest bottleneck. And so when you talk about the attention to yourself, I'm sort of fascinated by that concept. And so these two sort of places that are really different than what you're talking about around self-transformation are popping into my mind, you know, sort of religion and um, manufacturing consulting. Um, it, it's, it's quite fascinating to me. What, what brought you as a leader uh, into this space? What made you want to do this work in the world? I had a gift, a gift when I was 12 years old. Um, I uh, was brought up in Casablanca, Morocco. I'm French, you can hear by my accent, but I was brought up in Casablanca. And I was in the garden watching my family getting ready to sit down for dinner. And uh, I think I must have been in a moment of stillness, you know, just watching them. And suddenly I had a download. It was an epiphany. And there was, uh, and I just got a message. The first message was that I was being brought up in a cocoon that had absolutely nothing to do with what was happening in the world and that I needed to go and find out because there was a range from joy to despair. And everything, every single experience was available in the world. And I was having just a tiny little one. Oh, so I, I got that. That was interesting. Then the next uh, insight came saying, um, and everything you're going to discover, everything you're going to discover is an illusion. Mm. So that was a bit more complicated. And then the third one, was more like a command. It was like, all right, now you know what to do with your life. Go and tell people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, ran to my parents, right? And I said, okay, okay, I've got my instruction. I've got the secret. It's all an illusion. And we live in a cocoon. And my parents <laughs> looked at me and said, okay, we have a crazy one. And that nickname stayed with me all my life. And uh, with love, right? The crazy one. But when I left home at 18, I, um, you know, little by little, I just discovered the, the amazing gift I was given. Um, it was like a, a blue, how do you say, uh, you know, a map for me. So that's mm. how I started. I never looked back. I I don't know if there is this impulse for me to discover the illusion of life and tell people about it. <laughs> and what challenges did you face taking everything online? What, what were some of the challenges? What did you do? How did you experiment? Um, you know, as a leader, how did you experiment as you looked at changing the format, you know, for delivery in the last couple of years? Oh, well, um, I was concerned only by one thing, right? For me, going online was really good because that meant that I could have an international um, audience, right? So that's brilliant. But I didn't know, instead of having three days weekend, how to have a two-hour session. So it was a little bit of a, a trial, trying what worked, what didn't work. And it took me about a year, a year and a half to find out the good format. But my students are very generous and I don't hide anything, right? I said, listen, we're going to see what, you know, I had to find the right platform and the right things and how to have assignments and, and answer questions and all that. And then the other thing was, was I able to transmit, because part of my teaching, Melanie, what makes my teaching powerful is that there is a, a transmission to what I say. It's not so much what I say. is my students report to me is that um, it, there is an energy called transmission. Somehow they can walk out of a session not remembering a word of what I've said, but something stays with them, an opening, a lightness. So I wasn't sure that I could uh, 
do it online. But what I did is that I recorded, I wrote a book called The Elegance of Simplicity. I recorded it on audio. And then I listened to it, which is not pleasant, you know, to listen to yourself, but I listened to it. <laughs> and after about six or seven chapters, I realized <laughs> that I was being impacted by something. So I thought, okay, it works. So that's what I had to deal with. That's so interesting that even um, even the words you speak, and, and I have the same sort of feeling sometimes that things just come out of my mouth, they come through me. And um, it's not something I talk about much, but occasionally I will listen back to something I've recorded and be like, whoa, that was better than I could have thought I would do. <laughs> like, that was really yeah. good. And yeah. it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, like how um, there's these moments of brilliance. And if you're recording, when you say them, you know, you may not actually have access to those all the time. No, that's, that's my favorite thing about leading, right, and teaching, is that at one point you are so for the other person, so much in the space of the other person with an intention to really contribute to the other person that you as an ego disappear. And when you disappear, your character disappear, your personality disappear, you have this direct connection to guidance and intuition and, and um, really amazing things come out of your mouth, right? At that point, Melanie, you just say, wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I even sometimes told people things about their life that I had no way of knowing. Hmm. I, I yeah. somehow believe that about you, Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just meeting you today. I, I just believe that about you. Um, tell me how you, like, what do you do for self-care as you're doing this work, as you're bringing people to deep transformation? What do you do as a leader for yourself? All right, so every day I spend one and a half hours working in nature, right? That's very important. I have my dogs, my dogs. I know I'm a 60-year-old woman with two little dogs, but I they, they I take them out, and that's my biggest nurturing moment. I don't know. It's pure love. You know, it's like being with children. Nature plus my dogs. Then I uh, physically have uh, acupressure every two weeks. I meditate every day. And what I do, I am constantly, like about two or three hours a day, constantly seeking other teachers, masters, mystic, philosophers. I constantly look to expand my experience. As a teacher, I would only teach what I have personally experienced because I stay away from concept and description. I just want to transmit something. It's my experience, right? So I spend, yeah, half of my day, <laughs> or at least a third of my day, expanding my uh, space, learning, inquiring, discovering. Well, and I'm really fascinated by this idea of transformation as business. Mm -hmm. And you're obviously partaking in other people's transformation or spiritual businesses. How would someone discern, how do you discern whether someone's for real or is um, yeah. in it for something untoward or yeah. 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 has a, a, a not a good intention? Yes, I was self-centered. intention. Well, I have a system which I trust very much. It's, I've been doing it for 30 years and it really works. So first you need to have awareness, right? You need to have awareness, but you, I can always trust what moves me, mm. what inspires me, or what touches me. Mm. If one of those three happens, then I will trust and take the risk. Mm. Because then, you know, then I just consider that my soul is reached and that cannot happen through lie manipulation and um, agendas. And so that's how I proceed. And what are you excited about for the next year in your 
in your world, in your leadership, in your business? You know, I'm actually excited with the shift that is happening in leadership, right? And um, this shift have, has been predicted since the 16th century, I think. Right? There is a shift that is happening from Homo sapiens to Homo spiritus. Homo sapiens is being connected to your five senses and using your five senses to connect to what is external to you and to look for power outside of you, right? That's a homo sapiens. That's called the ego. You identify and look for energy on things external to you. Homo spiritus is when you look for energy for authentic power internally connecting to your soul. And that shift is truly, um, uh, for me, a celebration because it is a possibility of a new culture for humankind. And it's happening in leadership. I speak to people at the United Nations or in a, a leadership position and the traditional leadership of working hard, more hours, going to the office, uh, producing results, management, and all mm. that is elevating um, in the most uh, thrilling way for me. It's awakening. People are going from sil sleepwalker to awakening. And um, so that's what I'm looking for. I think it's a very difficult and very exciting time to be alive. Mm. And how can people find you, Sophie? I have uh, made it very simple. The best way to find me is my website. It's my name, sophiemclean.com. So on the website, you have everything I provide, all the links, all the explanation, all the videos, the book, the blog, the everything. Amazing. Um, <laughs> well, it has been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being my first live guest. I think it went okay. I'm. It's been really fun to be talking with you, um, and uh, and it's just been a pleasure. Thank you, Melanie, and I am so proud. I was the first one. <laughs> I, sh I shall subscribe to your channel and see what happens. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that was so much fun. I love this idea of leadership and transformation, digging into the idea of suffering. There's so many different ways to get to innovation and using things like religion and spirituality as a way, as, as teasers or flirts from the, the world to enliven our leadership, to deepen our leadership, and to think about the idea of alleviating suffering is a really interesting way to take some of the charge out of the ways that we need to change. I challenge you to look in your own life and um, over the next week, Think about how you are suffering and notice when you're suffering and notice um, why you might be suffering or how you might alleviate your own suffering. I'd love to challenge you to take this on and go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we're dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment. <laughs>